My name is Steve Ambrose. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. I currently live in Birmingham, Alabama, and my shop is located south of Birmingham on Lake Martin, Alabama. I've been building canoes since about 2000. Um, the first one was one I did for myself, and now my wife refers, it, refers to it as the hobby gone terribly mad. I grew up, um, like I said, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, but my mother was from Northern Maine, and, and uh, she was a school teacher. Uh, as soon as my brother and I were both school age, she went back to teaching, so she had the summers off just like we did. And we would go back to the family camp for most of July, some of August. Uh, so I spent a lot of time in Northern Maine around wood canvas canoes. We had an old garish at the camp that nobody knew what it was. Uh, and that, that was my first exposure to it. So the, the first canoe that I grew up with was a wood canvas canoe. A lot of it has to do with that old garish. Um, it fell into disrepair. At the time, I didn't have the, the skills or the, or the desire to restore it. It was, it was pretty far gone. Uh, we ended up donating it to a small craft museum that you know, with the understanding that it was going to be restored and displayed under my grandfather's name, uh, the, the museum ended up going belly up and the boat collection got scattered and we still don't know what happened to it. It hadn't been seen since and it, like I said it was in pretty bad shape so more than likely it probably got destroyed. Um, but the, the, the motivation and, and a lot of the satisfaction that I get out of working with these canoes is restoring them and, and handing them back to the next generation. Another, another factor that, or another influence, I should say, that, that got me into this was our, our neighbor uh, at the camp up in Maine. Uh, he's now in his early 90s. Um, he built canoes. He started out much like I did, building one for himself. And before he finished it, one of his friends wanted to buy it. So he started another. And that grew into building two or three every winter and somehow he never managed to keep one. <laughs> they ended up in friends' hands or, or you know, people wanted to buy them. Um, and and I, would go, I would go look at his shop. He usually wasn't building in the summer, but you know, I'd go by his farm and, and go in and look at the forms and everything else that he used to build one. And, and after, after we donated the garish, I asked him to build one for our camp uh, to replace it. And just watching the process of how that one was put together and, and watching it being built, you know, he was sending us pictures. That was really before internet and email, but uh, it, was, it was intriguing to me to, to watch the boat being built. Um, and that kind of planted the seed. And then, then my mom and dad, for Christmas one year, gave me a copy of Roland and Jerry's book. And that really seeded it. Um, at that point, I knew I wanted to build one. I just, at that time, didn't, didn't have the space or the time to do it. Um, several years later, I called Roland and I, and I talked to him several times. Uh, ended up buying a set of plans for the Chiaman and buying the materials that I needed to build it. I took it all home with me that fall and it sat stacked in the garage for a couple of years. And the running joke was, how do you like my canoe? <laughs> Finally, about, I guess, 10 years ago or so, I, I built the form, built the first boat um, with the intention of building several others for friends and family members and maybe selling a couple. And, uh, and I think I built three or four after that. And then all of a sudden, you know, being stuck down in the south, um, I didn't realize there were that many old canoes down there, but they started coming in from, from everywhere. People would call me and say, I hear you build canoes, do you work on them, do you restore them? Um, there were a lot more down there than I ever thought there, there were. Uh, they'd, you know, they'd been stashed in boathouses or garages or attics when they, when they fell into disrepair because nobody knew what to do with them. And, Next thing I know, I'm, I'm restoring canoes and not building them. Uh, I just started another one 
about a month ago, and I think that's the first new one I've built in two years. I've been so busy restoring older boats. Well, currently the only the only new one that I'm building is is Roland's design, the Chiaman. Um, I'm looking at taking lines off other boats and, and trying to come up with one of my own, but so far I've been too busy to do that. <laughs> I use you know, the, the northern white cedar um, for the ribs and, and typically western red cedar for the planking. Um, the western red cedar is not a problem. I've got a, a wholesaler down there that, that handles strictly western red cedar, so that's not an issue, but nobody down in that area has ever heard of northern white cedar, much less stock it. So uh, I, I usually every other year uh, will take a trailer load home with me when I go up to Maine in the summer. So I'll, I'll buy it up there and, and take it back with me because there's, there's nowhere to get it down there. Summer down there is, is extremely hot and extremely humid, um, which presents challenges in the paint and varnish end of things because you know, the solvents flash so fast that it's hard to keep a wet edge, but um, the upside to being down there is we don't have the cold to deal with. Um, so really July and August is probably not a good time to paint or varnish a canoe, um, but I can literally work all winter with uh, minimal, minimal amount of heat, so I guess it's a decent trade-off. <laughs> I don't have to shovel snow. <laughs> uh, the tools that I use, I already had a full, a full-blown wood shop uh, before I ever even got into building wood canvas canoes. My dad was a woodworker, a hobbyist. Uh, he was an engineer by trade, but had a full wood shop in the in the basement or the garage. Um, so I grew up around it and. Once I got the, the space and time to, to do my own, I started acquiring my own tools. Um, the Probably the largest tool that I have would be the table saw, and I just upgraded it last year to a, a three horsepower saw stop, which automatically senses conductivity at the blade. If you, if you touch it with your finger, it fires a break into the blade. Um, the primary reason for, for upgrading to that saw was I've I've got two part-time helpers that haven't been around woodworking equipment that much and it was more of a not really liability issue but um, you know I want everybody to be able to count to 10 at the end of the day um, and it, ran, you know, it ranges from from that saw down to your basic hand tools, planes, um, I like spoke shaves, draw knives, uh, a little bit of everything. The, I, I enjoy working with the hand tools, but the, uh, the power tools certainly make things easier. The part-time help that I have right now, um, they're not really apprentices. They're, they're good friends of mine that enjoy doing this type of work. Um, eventually, I will get to the point where I need full-time help. Um, my goal, ultimately, is to, is to retire into full-time canoe building and, and restoration. Uh, at, at this stage, unfortunately, it's still a side job, if you will. People that have influenced what I do and the way I do it, of course, Rollin and Jerry through the book and through personal interaction with them over the years, uh, and then our, our neighbor up in Maine, uh, I, he probably built over 100 canoes, uh, but he never did it professionally, uh, at least not as far as, he didn't have a business, I guess, and he, and he really didn't restore, he, he fixed, repaired a couple of canoes, but his primary uh, enjoyment was just building new ones. Um, his name is Ken Wetmore. Uh, he was obviously an influence. Uh, those are probably the primary ones. The most challenging is one that's currently in process. Uh, it was a, it's a 1929 Carlton that uh, was bought new. I mean, it's a family boat. The grandmother bought it new in 1929. 
her son grew up in it, her grandson grew up in it. Um, it fell into disrepair and at some point granddad fiberglassed it, including running glass up over the decks. Um, and then it, it got left out in the weather upright, so it was holding water in the bottom of the boat. The planking's all buckled. The ends are gone. I got the fiberglass off of it, and at that point I had to call him. I, I called the son and had to have a heart-to-heart -heart discussion with him because at that point I knew that it was going to cost more to restore this canoe than it was worth. And I didn't want to dive into it without him understanding that because as we all know some of these restoration projects are financially stupid. Um, he thought about it and, and, I, and I even offered up, I have, I had several boats in the shop that would have been nice easy restorations, um, would have been beautiful boats when they were done but they wouldn't have been his boat. Uh, he thought about it, probably discussed it with his family and they called back and said, we want you to proceed. I said, okay, as long as you understand that when you get this back, it's going to have a couple of ribs and some of the side planking, and that's about it. I mean, it's essentially going to be a new boat. And he said, I understand, but that's, it, it'll still be Granny's canoe. That's probably the most challenging one uh, that I've seen yet. Uh, the most interesting is probably a little 11 foot Morris that um, Mackie bought from, um, from Catherine and I called her and asked her some questions about it because I knew she'd had it owned it at one point, her and Dennis owned it. And she said that as far as she knows it's the only surviving 11 foot Morris in the database. So. You know, it's obviously an honor to work on something like that and, and somewhat intimidating because you obviously don't want to screw something up if it's the last one in existence. So that'll be a, that'll be a challenge. I do see myself as, as hopefully prolonging the life of these boats. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the, the, the overall age of the, of the builders and restorers and, and there aren't many younger guys or younger people getting into this um, and, and that concerns me uh, because you know, the, the boats themselves can last generations but if, if the skills don't get transferred you know when people like Roland and Jerry finally decide I've had enough and retire um, there needs to be people that, that can step up and, and fill, fill that gap, fill that need um, otherwise they'll just gradually disappear. I, I think the future of wood canvas canoes, um, antique boats in general, but specifically wood canvas canoes is, is going to depend largely on family tradition. Um, the ones that, that I really enjoy working on and dealing with uh, typically they haven't changed hands, they're, they're in the same family that they've been in. Um, several of them that I've worked on were either one or, or two generations that, and, and being passed off to the third generation. Um, I think it's important for people that own the boats to share them with other people, to teach their kids how to use them properly and, and, and get their kids using them. Um, otherwise, they're going to end up in a garage or a boathouse and 10, 20 years from now, nobody has any interest in it. Um, I, think the, I think the boats themselves are, are certainly not going to languish you know, from, from lack of use. I mean, they, they're basically in dry storage at that point as long as they're being protected, but the... the uh, I guess the real challenge is keeping or getting new generations interested in paddling these boats. Um, you know, teach them how to use them properly so they're not, they're not scared of them. There is a canoe culture in the South. Um, it's obviously not as prevalent as it is in New England or the 
uh, Michigan, Wisconsin area. Um, but there are a surprising number of people that as children went to camps in the Northeast or up in Michigan or Minnesota and got exposed to wooden canoes and some of them brought some home or ended up with one later in life. Um, and there's a, there are a, there are plenty of canoes down there that were purchased um, new from the factory, whether it was Old Town or, or Thompson or whoever, um, that were shipped south. Um, if you look at the population, and, and Benson can probably tell you how many of them went south and how many of them stayed in the traditional areas, but he told me at one point, I can't remember the number, but it did surprise me. Uh, there's a lot of them down there that, um, that families enjoy using. One factor that keeps people from paddling as much down there as, as people do typically up in this region is just the heat. Uh, by the time you get into midsummer, it's just not fun to go out in 95 degree heat unless it's early in the morning or at sunset. Um, we, you know, the rivers that we have down there really aren't conducive to wood canvas canoes and, and the temperature and humidity is, is something else that probably makes it less enjoyable than it is up in this area. The experience uh, of paddling a wood canvas canoe versus aluminum or plastic or composite, uh, to me it's, it's totally different. And I spent time in, in, in basically all, all types. Uh, as a Boy Scout I paddled aluminum canoes. We did canoe trips up in Canada, summer camp. Um, but I was biased at an early age because I, I grew up in, an, in a wood canvas canoe and the aluminum ones just yeah, they were they were like paddling a beer can. They were loud, um, and they certainly weren't indestructible. Um, the the plastic Royal X composite, whatever you want to call it, uh, I had one for quite a while, um, even after I started building wood canvas canoes. And you put two adults into that plastic canoe, and the bottom pops up because you've got 200 pounds in each end of it. The bottom comes up. Uh, you put two, two full, the same two adults in, in one of my wood canvas canoes and it retains its shape. So it paddles differently. Uh, the plastic one was all over the place because you, you basically got an oil can center section with the ends sticking down in the water. Um, it's just a different experience and I think obviously part of that is part of that's you know mental or perception or whatever you want to call it but just knowing that that the canoe that you're in uh, was built out of forest products instead of stamped out of something is and it was made by hand um, to me that that gives it a whole different feel some of that some of that I think is perceived some of it is real at least in, in my heart, in my mind. I got involved with the Wooden Canoe Heritage Association through, um, through, my, through my interaction with, with Roland and Jerry. Um, and I'm trying to remember what sparked me to go to my first assembly. Um, Anyway, I, I got involved in WCHA through, through Roland and Jerry's influence. Um, once I started getting the, the magazine and, and really getting interested in it as, as the organization, um, I learned a lot from, I learned a lot from the forum, from the website. Um, and all that just, I guess, spurred me to join and, and get active in it. Um, I get a I get a lot out of out of coming to assembly. I don't make it every year, but I, I try to. Uh, I enjoy it. I enjoy seeing everybody. I enjoy seeing the canoes and, and looking at other people's work and and uh, catching up with everyone. 
There is a Wooden Canoe Heritage Association chapter uh, out of Florida. Um, they're out of South Florida. It's, it's a bit of a stretch. Uh, they do some nice trips. I haven't made one yet, but they, they do some really nice annual trips. One that they do, they go to the Okie Finoki Swamp uh, and paddle. Um, another chapter that I've become involved with is the Three Rivers chapter out of the Pittsburgh area. It's 60 miles from my parents' farm. Um, I'm doing some work up there with, with, uh, with a friend of mine and started talking with, with a couple of, of their members. Uh, it turns it, again, it was, it was the online forum that put me in touch with them. Uh, Fred Campanos, uh, and myself were both working on narrow rib Thompson's at the same time and we were comparing notes and trying to figure out what was supposed to be you know what was correct and what wasn't uh, and I started talking to him and, and, and reading their newsletters they're they're one of the most active chapters in the in the uh, organization and I joined I joined that chapter which is even further away from me than the one in South Florida but I do get up that direction several times a year and uh, visit with them and try and try and plan a trip around an activity that they've got going. If nobody was was building wood canvas canoes anymore, uh, I, I think the I think paddle sports in general would would lose a a heritage, uh, a way of life. Um, yeah, most most young people when they think of paddle sports don't even consider wood canvas canoes. They think of of playboats, plastic kayaks, and running white water, and and uh, sit on top kayaks. Kayaks are in general are, are probably more popular with younger people because they're easy. Um, but it, I I can't even imagine what it would be like without wood canvas canoes around because they've been, I mean, they're a part of our history. Um, without them, uh, I, I don't know, that, that, that's a tough question. I, I know that it would be a huge loss. Last year I transitioned from basically working in my garage to working in a non-climate controlled aircraft hangar um, it does have heat in it, so I, I can keep things from freezing in the winter, but the only, the only cooling is, is a big fan. So that's only going to get it down to the ambient temperature. Um, in my garage, I was somewhat spoiled because the garage is not insulated from the rest of the house, so some of the heating and cooling inside the, the living space leaches into the garage so I wasn't dealing with these huge temperature variations. Uh, it's, it's been a challenge this spring and summer getting used to what we can and can't do, especially with the finish work. Um, you know, once it, once it gets up above 90 degrees, it's, it's tough. I mean, I'd love to be doing it full time right now. Uh, one of the toughest things that I deal with is timing. Because if I'm, I'm doing it part-time um, and being able to try and give somebody a guesstimate on when it's going to be finished is tough. Because just, you know, just like pretty much everybody else, I try and do them in the order that I get them to be fair to everybody. And if, if one turns out to be a basket case, it slows everything else down. But most people are, yeah, most people are fairly understanding about it. But I, I certainly, I, I never could quite understand why Roland and Jerry would uh, basically tell people it's, it's finished when it's finished and, and I'll call you when I start on it and I might have a, an idea of when I'm going to be done at that point, but I'm not going to give you a date. Now I know why. Because <laughs> once you give them one, it puts a huge amount of pressure on you. And then the, you know, then the, the, uh, the temptation is there to, to rush it or cut corners, and nobody wants that. Doesn't do me any good, doesn't do them any good, but they want to paddle. 
but I, I'm, I think, uh, I hope that I'm really close to doing it full time. Um, there's some family stuff that's changing that, that might make it easier to transition. But uh, I think one of the reasons that, that we don't see a lot of young builders and restorers is it's difficult to do full time and make a decent living at it. I mean, there's a, there's a there's a ceiling to what a canoe can bring as far as income. You know, it's not like restoring a 30 foot Chris Craft or a Rolls Royce or something. I mean, there there's a limit to what you can realistically price it out at, unless it's one of the last surviving. <laughs> But I, I think that may be one, I, I think it's a, a big barrier to, uh, to why you don't see more people like Dylan and Emily. Um, I mean, you, gotta, you, have to, you have to make a living and, and provide for a family.